All right, thank you guys for uh, for showing up to the meeting. Um, I'm gonna apologize off the bat. I'm a little under the weather, so if I have to stop and blow my nose or take a drink or something, please uh, bear with me. All right, so oh, let's see. Let me get my PowerPoint up here and hopefully I can. Loading my presentation. All right. All right. Um, oh, shoot. I bet I'm in the wrong presentation mode, aren't I? Oops. Oh, wait. Oh. All right, how's this how's this looking? What do you see, to, um, Andrea? I see water chemistry. Okay, so you see my um, you see my uh, full screen presentation then. Correct. All righty. All right, so um, today's presentation is about um, is about water chemistry and how that relates to water quality. All right, so first off, um, when we get started, uh, some of the resources or the resources that we're using, um, we've got hard copy resources and free online resources. So um, first of all, the free hard copy uh, water quality resources that we have are the Healthy Water, Healthy People uh, Field Monitoring Guide and the Stream Keepers Field Guide. And um, if you contact, Tina Harding, um, she's the other aquatics member. She can um, she can send you those sources for free. So um, please reach out. Those are they're they're good good resources written, um, especially the Healthy Water, Healthy People. Um, they're written for for school age um, audiences. All right. Um, the next online resources that we have are. Um, there's an EPA water quality monitoring um, resource. I've got the the um, the website down at the bottom. I'm gonna open it, see if you can see it. And if if it opens and you guys can see it, can you let me know? Do you guys see this? No. I think yeah. it works best, Benita, mm -hmm. if you open it on another website and share that website not through your um powerpoint oh okay okay like like that let's see now do you switch it's loading it's loading do you see this mm -mm. all right well if you don't um yeah, I'm not sure how to make it do that. I know we had that same problem last time, didn't we? So you want this bottom? Um, go back. I'll try to. Share. Oh, I'm going. I'm going forward. Whoops. There we go. I was looking at this, <coughs> the one on the left, the EPA one. Oh, okay. No, I don't see it. Well, let's just. Oh, okay. We'll just move on then. Um, wow. All right. So let me get back to the right slide now. Oh my goodness. All right. So um, if you look at the chapter five of the uh, water quality monitoring um, EPA source, you can see there's all the sections 5.1, 5.2, 5.4. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in that um, on that source, you only want to look at you only need to know the or read the um, for each parameter, the what is it and why is it important? And I didn't put that a screenshot of that on there, but you'll know when you get to this page again, just click on the, for example, temperature or turbidity and there will be a, a heading that says what is it and why is it important? So 
you don't need to know all the um, all the technical details um, about that. And the other resource that's a good one is the USGS um, Water Science School. And I know we've mentioned this one a few times and I just put a, <coughs> excuse me, a screenshot of that um, on this slide, just kind of so you can see what the homepage looks like. And then you could go over to the right side and click on down on water quality at the bottom. And there again, you can look at all the, um, um, the more details on each parameter. All right, so why do we do um, water testing? So water quality is basically the quality of water. It's pretty logical. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But you want to determine the, the, the chemical makeup, what things are dissolved in it. And sometimes those are natural elements and other times they might be contaminants or pollution. And so in general, water quality is just a measure of how suitable the water is for what, what we want to use it for, whether it's physical, chemical, or biological characteristics. So <clears throat> if you think about it, water quality that you would drink isn't the same, um, uh, doesn't have the same parameters or the same qualities <clears throat> as water quality would be for a habitat for fish. So Basically, water quality, it's not what what's good water quality for one use isn't necessarily good water quality for another use. All right, so some of the parameters that. <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I got to cough a little bit here. <clears throat> All right, sorry, I'm kind of coughing up a lung, but um, I'm just going to go from this page here. <clears throat> so what makes good water is by measuring certain parameters like dissolved oxygen, and that's important for how much oxygen there is for uh, organism to, organisms to breathe. Um, nutrients like nitrates and phosphates. Um, those are both naturally occurring, but they can get into the water system through the use of uh, fertilizers and other things. And when they get into the water, they can cause overgrowth of algae. Um, pH is a measure of the acidity or alkalinity of the water. Um, temperature affects life cycles and dissolved oxygen. There's turbidity, which affects, uh, which is a measure of how clear or how cloudy the water is. And Turbidity is just a, a general measurement. It could be whether it's sand, silt, algae, plankton, waste, sewage, whatever. And um, conductivity is a more um, is a different kind of a measurement that measures the ions in the water. Um, it measures ions, but it won't tell you which kind of ions are in the water. And then there is total dissolved solids, and that's just a measurement of anything dissolved in the water that's not water. All right. So I know Tina mentioned this in the last uh, aquatics um, training session, but it's a real important point is that the two types or categories of pollution based on where they come from. So there's point source pollution, and that's pollution that can be traced back to where it came from. So we call it point source. And that's Usually maybe like sewage outlets, stockyards, um, industrial, industrial waste. And um, the point source pollution is highly regulated. The EPA regulates that um, and sets limits. They do a lot of inspections. And if these industries or um, whatever source that came from is found to be um, uh, putting pollutants into the environment, they can face really heavy fines. <clears throat> And the other source of pollution is the non-point source pollution. And that's all of the pollution that, it's pollution that can't be traced back to a point or origin. And so it's pollution that's been picked up by, <clears throat> it's been picked up by runoff. So 
as water from precipitation or snow melt or whatever flows across the land, it's picking up everything in its path and bringing it into uh, water bodies. So, so it's very difficult to trace back to its point. And um, the non-point source pollution is, um, although we only hear about the point source pollution problems, the pollution that happens because of some kind of big oil spill or something, it's the non-point pollution that um, that's much harder to regulate and is an equal problem to the point source pollution or possibly even worse because there's no way to regulate it really. And, and uh, everybody contributes just a little bit to the non-point source pollution. So um, it's grant like uh, Envirothon and Prairie Waters um, where I work, and uh, the project WET where Tina works, <clears throat> we all receive grant money that specifically for non-point source pollution because the only real way to prevent, uh, to uh, control it is through education and prevention. So um, the government puts a lot of money into education to prevent non-point source pollution. So um, that's just a point I, I really wanted to stress there. Questions so far. <clears throat> I was just going to say, Benita, right now, um, with the warmer weather and a lot of the snow melt happening, uh, we are seeing an increase in the non point source pollution. And if we stop and we look at um, our own area and where that water is going once it leaves our yard, such as I don't know about you, but I've been putting salt down for the last couple of weeks. And now that salt is part of that water. Well, where's that water going? It's going to my street. Where does that go? Well, it goes into the uh, water drain down the, uh, down the block. And then eventually, so um, it really is difficult to pinpoint where our non-point source pollution, but if we take the time and we just notice our environment around us and how we're, what are we adding to that environment as humans, um, then we can kind of get a better understanding of how hard it is to trace some of this uh, pollutant that we're having to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in our water systems. Yeah, exactly. And um, you mentioned the salt. The other thing that they put down a lot of is sand. And <clears throat> non-point source pollution doesn't have to just be some type of chemical or something that's been put down. It can also be um, soil and sediment from erosion. So um, I just wanted to make that point too. So um, especially again now, once um, once uh, as we come into spring and with the with the melting and the runoff and what kind of mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me erosion that brings with it. So we'll keep moving on here. <clears throat> All right, I have to cough again. Oh boy, sorry everybody. All right, so um, first parameter is kind of the most simple and direct and, and direct one is um is water temperature and uh, it's important because it's related to dissolved oxygen levels um, it affects uh, aquatic plants and photosynthesis rates um, bacteria and other diseases thrive in warmer water and it also affects uh, other aquatic organisms um, certain organisms have a tolerance range um, it can affect life cycles like especially like in the spring when you think of when uh, bugs are laying their eggs, or if they're emerging from from dormancy, that's all affected a lot by the the water temperature. And you can think the same thing with like salmon and fish spawning and that kind of thing. <clears throat> and also, aquatic organisms um, become more sensitive to disease and other pathogens when um, depending on water temperature. So some of the things that affect water temperature, think. Vegetation along along the banks, especially of a smaller stream or river. So 
is that stream or river getting direct sunlight because the the shade um, will uh, block the sun and result in cooler water. It'll also that sh the shade or the the root systems from the the plants alongside the river will um, will filter out some of the sediment from erosion, and again that'll keep the the water body from becoming darker in color with the with the um, sediment from erosion and also affect uh, and without that dark color the water will stay cooler um, surface area so larger area more absorbs more sunlight um, what color is the riverbed if the riverbed happens to be a dark color just like um, if you were to walk out on asphalt in the hot summer um, with your bare feet I hope you wouldn't do that because it could be really really hot so uh, same goes with our, our rivers and streams how deep is the water? If it's shallow, obviously that's going to um, warm up a lot faster than if the water is is deep. And what kind of current is there? So obviously the faster the water is moving, the more current, the more mixing you're going to get, and uh, the the faster current's going to heat up the water fa faster. And the last one is urban runoff. So um, like I mentioned, um, earlier back in the uh like the riverbed color <clears throat> so in urban runoff when you have a lot of asphalt and black streets <clears throat> think if you have a rainfall like an afternoon rainfall after the sun has beat down on that asphalt all day water that runs <clears throat> into the storm drains and then into the river or stream is going to be a lot warmer um, than it would be out in a more rural area and, and lastly, any oops, excuse me. Go ahead. Oh, Go ahead. And lastly, any industrial. Oh, okay. Lastly, any industrial wastewater. So if there's a an industry that's that's um, putting uh, water for, from their um, from their processes that's been heated up, if they're discharging that heated water directly into um, a water body, again, that's going to um, increase water temperature. I was just going to say, Vanita, mm -hmm. uh, actually, we have a lake in North Dakota. So I wonder if the students know this, but there is a lake in North Dakota that during the summer months, it registers about 90 to 100 degrees. But in the winter months, it stays about 60 to 70 degrees. Oh. And that's Nelson Lake, the Minnetonka power plant discharges into that lake okay. and when they do it the water is hot and it's what keeps that lake so literally it's warmer than most of our bath water okay and then yeah and that'll be a real important part coming up next when we talk about the dissolved oxygen all right anything else no i just all thought right. that would be a good little tidbit right there <laughs> Yeah, it is. All right, so um, next up, the next parameter we're gonna talk about is dissolved oxygen, um, which is logically oxygen dissolved in the water. Um, sometimes for short, we call it DO. And um, there are two ways that oxy oxygen can enter. It can enter at the surface, um, it, or it can be released by aquatic plants through photosynthesis, okay? Um, I did put in the slide here, and again, since I, I'm not even going to try to open the, the link, and hopefully you guys can look through this, um, this PowerPoint um, after, I, after the presentation, but I put a link into the uh, dissolved oxygen kit, and I was hoping to do a demonstration today, but since I'm under the weather and working from home, I, I don't have that here. But um, And the reason I posted this is because at the um, at the Cheyenne River Envirothon that was held at Prairie Waters, uh, I had the students. Part of the test was to test dissolve, or part of the the I guess test was to uh, determine dissolved oxygen. And so um, the way this kit works, it's pretty neat. You fill that um, you fill this um, this vial up with uh, 25 milliliters of water. And the kit comes with these glass ampules and you can just kind of push it against the side and you break the tip off. 
And then once you've broken the tip off, you take it out and agitate it back and forth. And I noticed one group um, just broke the tip off and that 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 ampule is under a vacuum. So it sucks the water up into the into the tube and uh, the reaction takes place. But these students didn't take it out of the uh, didn't take it out of the, the the sample cup. And so once the sample was pulled into the tube and it lost its vacuum, all the color, all all the uh, reagent and water sample just leaked back out into the cup. So they weren't <laughs> they weren't able to take a reading. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that. And again, um, there is a video on that Chemetrics dissolved oxygen um, uh, on their website. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that. Quick thing, Benita. Mm -hmm. uh, all these links I will include in the YouTube description box. So you guys will be able to easily click, go on the description in YouTube. And you'll be able to have access to all these links um, if you can't see them through the video to make that okay. easier for teams. And then uh, also we have a question. Oh um, no. Does, does the salt I put on my driveway hurt the environment? I use the friendly version. Um well Benita, um oh wait, yeah. Uh, I actually I was trying to type that in and answer that question. As an individual single application of salt on a driveway, does it hurt the environment? No. But when you stop and think about that, everybody down your street has now put salt on their driveway. And then that salt becomes part of the runoff. Depending on where that runoff goes, will depend will determine whether or not the salt will impact the environment or if it impacts our water discharge that the wastewater treatment plants have to deal with. So it's really based on where, where does that runoff go to? Um, so salt, yes, it could hurt uh, the environment, but when we typically don't use it until there's a great amount of water that's going to be diluting the salt that you have added to your, your driveway. It's not a yes or no answer. It's you have to look at the math and the amount that's being applied. If you're one of those that takes uh, uh, one of the five gallon buckets and uses it in one application, I'm going to say yes, <laughs> you are going to have an environmental impact. But if you're using it sparingly and only when it's necessary and there's plenty of snow still left to melt that will dilute that salt or the sodium um, as it moves into our water systems, you have less impact. Did that make sense? Agree? Yeah. Yeah, and one thing I wanted to add to that, um, at one of our, our summer camps at Prairie Waters, we had made ice cream. So uh, part of making ice cream is um, we would fill a, a bag of ice with some rock salt and then put the another Ziploc bag inside that one with the cream and sugar and make ice cream. And one of our students during uh, one of our summer camps <clears throat> took all the salt water from the ice cream making and dumped it, dumped the whole bucket of it into one spot on the lawn. And now that that is a type of pollution, and you can you can see it because the grass is all dead there. So, um, yes, if you uh, you know, or if you don't misuse things and you're and you're being conscientious about it and using salt sparingly, it's not going to be a, a big problem. But again, if it's a, a big dumping, I guess. <clears throat> you'll be able to see the results maybe even in your own yard, I guess is my point. All right, so I'm gonna keep on moving. Um, so back to the whole dissolved oxygen thing. Um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> so two ways oxygen can enter. It can either be dissolved at the surface. So think like wind uh, waves and waterfalls and things like that, or released by aquatic plants through photosynthesis. And Optimal levels of dissolved oxygen for um, um, for aquatic life is somewhere around the seven to nine milligram range. Um, anything, and each organism has their own tolerance level. Level, 
Um, but in general, most, most fish can't survive at levels below four milligrams per liter, which and milligrams per, per liter, if you didn't know, is also um, parts per million. Um, <clears throat> earlier in the, uh, let me see. All right, I'm just gonna skip that last slide and I'm gonna go to this one. So water, um, uh, dissolved oxygen can be impacted by various things. And one of those is water temperature. So we talked earlier about, um, about water temperature and that it does influence uh, dissolved oxygen. So as the water temperature changes, um, its ability to hold gases like oxygen also changes. So as water temperature, it's kind of, it's an inverse relationship. So as water temperature goes up, so think in the summertime, water's ability to hold oxygen decreases. And in the winter, when the water is cooling down, the uh, colder water uh, ha ha has the ability to hold more oxygen than the warmer water does. So um, if I go back this way, whoopsie. If you look back at this graph, you can see, um, so the, <clears throat> if you look like say at water at a temperature of zero degrees can hold upwards of 14, almost 15 um, milligrams per liter, whereas water at a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius um, has a um, decrease down to about 7.6. So just kind of keep that in mind that um, um, that kind of in, inverse relationship regarding temperature and dissolved oxygen. And if we were going to test you on this, we might, you know, say like like read a graph like that. That would be an example of a test question that that we would give you. All right. So other things, um, biochemical oxygen demand which is the amount of oxygen that's removed as other organisms break down organic matter. All right, so when you think about, it's not just the, the fish that are using oxygen, there's other um, organisms, including microorganisms that are, are living in a water body. Um, also, how much photosynthesis? There might be more at the surface because it's closer to the sun. Um, Obviously, photosynthesis occurs during the daytime when the sun is shining, and at night, uh, dissolved oxygen levels will drop off as um, uh, plants switch from photosynthesis to respiration. And other physical activity, wind, wind waterfalls, rapids, I think I talked about that. Um, I mentioned this earlier, that there are, two, that there are different ways to um, express dissolved oxygen values. So there's the milligrams per liter, <coughs> which is also parts per million. Um, and then the other one is percent saturation. And percent saturation pertains to that graph I showed you earlier, which is um, how saturated is the water with oxygen at that particular temperature, okay? So that goes back to that graph. And so, Think of saturated like a sponge. So that would be when water is completely saturated with oxygen, it'd be the point where the water can't hold any more oxygen. So, and um, this is the kind of the value we use to compare the amount of oxygen um, in the water with how much it, it could potentially hold. <clears throat> any questions on that? All right, I'm gonna keep going. All right, so nutrients like nitrogen, um, nitrogen, like I said earlier, it's naturally in our uh, environment and it's required for, for life and um, enters naturally through the nitrogen cycle, but unnaturally it, um, it comes from sewage, whether that's from animals or human sewage, um, wastewater and septic systems and fertilizer runoff. All right, and so mm -hmm. um, nitrates, if you were nitrogen, if you didn't know, is a, um, a big fertilizer that's put on our, um, our uh, crop fields. And so that's, um, uh, and I believe nitrogen is quite soluble in water, so it's easily picked up during runoff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, okay, keep going. All right, so when there are too many nitrates or too many fertilizers, um, 
because uh, um, nitrates and phosphates, which we'll talk about next, they're both a form of, of plant food, okay? So, um, and fertilizers work in water the same way they work on land. They encourage plant growth. And so once that gets brought into our water bodies, that accelerates algae growth. So even though algae is a natural part of, um, of our, our lakes and rivers, um, it's been exacerbated or made a lot worse because of the extra nutrients um, like nitrates and phosphates that we're putting into our, our, our water. So, um, so eutrophication in, in the scientific term is just a, it's a natural aging process of a water body. So all, all lakes go through this aging process, but usually the aging process happens over hundreds or thousands of years. Whereas once um, uh, human introduction of these nutrients and uh, algae growth, that really accelerates that aging pro uh, process. And in addition to uh, uh, contributing to eutrophication, um, nitrates can also cause health problems in humans. I think um, that's called like blue baby syndrome or something like that. And it can happen to health problems in humans, animals, and aquatic or organisms and through a series of chemical reactions it it um it can also lower um the lake ph but you know we experience this every summer and on an increasing basis and right. uh and they do put out warnings the health department environmental quality and the north dakota water resources do put out warnings of blue green algae Right, and I'm going to talk about that. Up. Oopsie, whoops, uh -oh. here in a second on this next slide. <clears throat> so here you can see kind of a graphic. So you can see this uh, this stream is completely covered with algae. And um, as Tina said, there are types of, um, I guess, photosynthetic bacteria like the blue green algae, which are actually a type of bacteria. Um, that do release toxins and those uh, they're neurotoxins so they affect your nerves and your brain and those can be um, can be deadly like I've heard of of small dogs dying within a matter of 15 minutes if they if they're um, exposed to to high enough levels and um, those blue green algae blooms can um, um, can also be pretty devastating to a livestock herd that's um, if there happens to be a uh, a blue green algae bloom in their um, uh, in their in their water source, so so if you look at the graph on the left, you can see if you start with number one, there's a nutrient load up. So extra nutrients from fertilizers or sewage or whatever is washed into the water um, through precipitation, and because um, nutrients encourage plant growth, whether it's on land or in water. There becomes a big explosion of plant growth, um, and that could be regular aquatic plants and and algae. Uh, the thing is, is algae grows a lot faster, and so <clears throat> once there's this layer of algae on top of a uh, a lake or a river, like you've seen, and I'm sure you guys have all seen these algae blooms, <clears throat> it block they block out the sunlight, and so once the sunlight's blocked out, what happens to the plants below that aren't getting the sunlight that they need is they start to die. And then the decomposers uh, start to break down that dead plant material and decomposers use oxygen just like our aquatic animals. And then there becomes a competition between the decomposers and our aquatic, our aquatic animals, the fish, aquatic invertebrates and things like that. And in this competition, who's gonna win? it's gonna be the decomposers win that because the decomposers are continuing to rapidly um, multiplying and they can live in much lower oxygen uh, levels than can our aquatic animals. So um, ultimately, if, uh, if it gets bad enough, there could be a death of an ecosystem where oxygen levels are so low, it's not possible for, uh, for life to exist and fish and other organisms die. <clears throat> But even even if it's not a, a big catastrophic death, um, if you think that most of the are these algae blooms occur in the summer and 
what did Tina say about about the, that lake in the summertime and all lakes is the temperature warms up. And especially in some of these smaller lakes that warm up so quickly in the summertime and these algae blooms happen. And what do we know about um, dissolved oxygen and temperature? So as temperature goes up, it's a, uh, the water temperature goes up, its ability to hold dissolved oxygen goes down. And that's why some of these, especially some of the smaller lakes that are, um, um, they warm up faster and um, they're more susceptible to these algae blooms because they're shallow <clears throat> and it doesn't take a lot of those, um, those nutrients to, to really cause a, a bad algae bloom. So um, if you see a, a fish kill, especially in the summer, it's not because the water got too hot, it's because there wasn't enough oxygen in that water body. So right. yeah. Are there more algae blooms than in the south of like the southern United States, <clears throat> North Dakota, since we are cooler in the summer or we have winter, or is it pretty well scattered um, in the country? Um, I would assume so, but um, you know, one of the reasons that, you know, like the Midwest has bad algae blooms is because of um because of our egg industry and how much fertilizers we use, but Again, I know down in like the Gulf of Mexico, there are dead spots from, <clears throat> from eutrophication from, if you think about last time we talked about watersheds. So if you think like the Mississippi River <clears throat> starts, <clears throat> the whole uh, Mississippi River watershed goes from Northern Montana and parts of Ohio and all of that water comes and drains into the Gulf of Mexico and all those, um, Nutrients are getting more and more concentrated, so um, it is pretty much an, a nationwide problem. And I would, I mean, I suppose, I mean, I suppose our algae blooms definitely have an end to it when it cools off. But um, I wouldn't say that anything is worse or better. Benita, can I add to that? Sure. Um, one of the things that Benita mentioned is due to our agricultural. Uh, partners out there that need to fertilize in order to grow crops. But did you know that it's not our farmers and our ranchers that create the most nitrate and phosphate runoff? I wonder if the students understand what the largest crop that we grow every summer is. Do you have any ideas, Benita? What, what's the largest crop we grow? We grow every summer and we spend lots of time oh, managing it. I would say that's people's lawns. Exactly. Lawns A and golf of, courses. Yes, go, lawns <clears throat> and golf courses. So it's not just the farmers out there that we got to be looking at that's providing our, um, that nitrate and phosphate overload in our water systems. We have to look at our own practices in our own area. You know, if everybody, once again, it goes, it's just like the salt. One person doing it and then it rains three or four days, it's not going to make a big impact. But if everybody in the community is fertilizing their lawns and we have a two or three day rain with runoff, it will impact these water storage areas. Right. And if I can just add to that is um, the thing with, with like homeowners is, uh, is that, so, um, Ag producers, they need to go through training. They can, um, in order to apply these types of uh, fertilizers to their fields, they have to be certified in um, applying these things so that they're applying the right amount. And if you think about it, they're very expensive. So um, that can be pretty um, hard on their bottom line if they're over applying um, fertilizers. <clears throat> now the average homeowner doesn't go through any training and doesn't know a lot about that. So, um, a lot of people have the uh, assumption that if some is good, more is better. And um, and it's the homeowners that tend to over fertilize their lawn. And in fact, I've got a neighbor who's killed his lawn a couple times doing that. So um, <clears throat> anyway, so uh, just uh, yeah, good point, Tina. I didn't mean to be hard on the farmers. I forgot about that. And yes, uh, um, and that's again why non-point pollution, you can't trace it back to a source. So it's part of everybody's problem. And everybody's part of the solution too. So I'll keep going. Uh, 
Let's see. The other nutrient of concern that we have is phosphate. So most of what we talked about with nitrate is also true for phosphate. Um, phosphate is also naturally in the environment, um, <clears throat> but it's also it's common in fertilizers and is also in some detergents and soaps. And if you look at some of your um, detergents or soaps now, you'll notice some of them say it's phosphate free. And the reason for that is because the phosphates in these soaps were, co were contributing to these um, algae blooms and decreased water quality. And so the, <clears throat> the thing with phosphate is it's an essential nutrient for plants and animals, and it's often considering the limiting nutrient in aquatic systems. So um, basically what that means is that it occurs in the least amount relative to the needs of the plant. Okay, so it doesn't take much before the plant has gotten the, um, the amount that it needs of, of phosphate. So naturally, uh, phosphate is uh, occurs through weathering and erosion of rocks and unnaturally through human wastes, industrial household fertilizers, and through erosion. <clears throat> because earlier I said that um, nitrates tend to be quite water soluble. Phosphates tend to bind with soil particles. So if there's a lot of erosion, that's bringing the phosphate into, um, into the water system. And it sounds like, according to my slide, more than half of the phosphorus um, in, our, in our water system enters unnaturally. All right, so again, too much phosphate contributes to those algae blooms. And remember, through algae blooms, that blocks out the sunlight, bottom plants die. Decomposers take over and break down that dead plant material, and those decomposers use oxygen, and there's none left for the other organisms. So then, fish and other organisms start to die. So, um, and it takes <clears throat> some pretty low um, low concentrations down to uh, what is that, two hundredths to four point uh, zero two point zero four micrograms per liter can lead to eutrophication through phosphates. All right, pH is the other uh, is another parameter that we look at. Um, <clears throat> it's a measurement of acidity or alkalinity. So um, I'm assuming most of you have at least heard of the pH scale, and it's a scale from zero to fourteen. And pH is something that I never really realized till I <clears throat> really started looking into this for Envirothon. Is that pH stands for power of hydrogen, and it's a measurement really of the um, positive hydrogen ions or the negative uh, hydroxyl ions. Okay, so hydrogen ions are for acids and hydroxyl, the OH, is for bases. And pH is important because it affects how the solubility, um, like are things able to dissolve in water and the bioavailability of nutrients. Okay, so um, and then, of course, pH is also, um, there are certain um, ranges, again, that our aquatic organisms can, <clears throat> can tolerate. And uh, according to this, it's about five to nine is, P is safe for most aquatic life. So if pure water has a pH of seven, then um, either side of uh, seven is the general range for um, for most aquatic life. Um, so what is the pH of most North Dakota streams? Does anybody want to guess on that? Do we have any guesses? All right, so it's around seven and a half to eight and a half. It's a little bit on the alkaline side. And the reason for this, which is on the next side, is pH is strongly influ if influenced by soil characteristics. And North Dakota soils are alkaline <clears throat> and they contain calcium carbonate, which when it washes into our streams and rivers, um, it will bring up the pH since higher pHs are alkaline or basic. And, um, and again, since most organisms are adapted to certain pHs, um, any um, variation too too far from that um, from that range 
will mean that those aquatic organisms can die. And I've got just a couple different graphs on here just to kind of give you an idea and you can look back at these. Again, we wouldn't ask you like what pH can fish live at? We wouldn't ask a question like that, but what we might do is put a graph like this up and have you read the graph and tell us like, you know, by by looking at the graph, tell us um, what what um, when those or what range those organisms can live in. All right. Um, next one is turbidity, and that is a measure of how clear or cloudy the water is. <clears throat> and again, uh, turbidity is composed of suspended solids, uh, things like um, algae or um, especially sediments and things from from erosion and many of North Dakota streams, rivers are very, and lakes are very turbid. <clears throat> and we measure turbidity by using this, uh, this black and white checkered disc. And um, the way this one, this particular one is um, being used off the side of a boat. So you lower it down, you lower that disc down into the water until you can't see the distinction between the black and white checkers. And it's um it's a pretty simple instrument, but it gives really good comparison results. And um, uh, <clears throat> I know we use that oopsie in our water monitoring. So I guess my computer wants me to keep going, so I will. So turbidity is important because again, um, any of those suspended particles like um, uh, sediment um, will block the sunlight and no sun means less photosynthesis and less photosynthesis means less oxygen. So when you're thinking about a lot of these parameters, I want you to kind of think back, like most of these will go back to come back at how much oxygen there is for our organisms to live. Um, uh, also, these suspended solids will make the water darker and absorb heat. And again, warm water doesn't hold as much oxygen as colder water. So again, that comes back to the um, to the oxygen levels. Um, these sediments will settle into spaces uh, in between rocks, so it takes away habitat for uh, macroinvertebrates and fish. Um, anything that's a filter feeder, um, it can choke them, can clog fi uh, fish gills, and um, I guess if, uh, if it's cloudy enough, um, it'll prevent them from seeing their, uh, their prey. So um, again, that's... Uh, and it's also provides a good place for bacteria and viruses and other uh, diseases to grow. <clears throat> Tina gave me a good idea. I should probably take a drink. All right, so I'm um, getting towards the end here. Um, specific conductivity is a measure of the ability of, of, of water to conduct an electrical current. So what it's a measure of basically is the ion concentrations in water. So pure water, with nothing else in it, just H2O, does not conduct an electrical current. It's when ions are dissolved in the water that then the water has the ability to conduct an electric current. So um, in our water monitoring, we do uh, test for con uh, specific conductivity. Um, again, though, it just tests to see if there are ions in the water. It doesn't specifically tell us which ones. And conductivity is closely related to uh, total dissolved solids. Um, but total dissolved solids is basically a measure of anything that's in the water that's not a water molecule. Um, but generally, they correlate pretty closely because a, a high total dissolved solids means a high, can often mean a high specific conductivity. All right, any questions? I forgot to put much in my review slide, but um, <clears throat> we've talked about the chemical testing. We've talked about, I guess, first we talked about resources. What resources? to use to, um, to learn about these um, uh, water testing. Um, any of those resources are good. Um, we don't expect you read all of them. It's a lot of information. But again, you know, pH doesn't change no matter what source you read it from. So, um, but a lot of those sources just explain things in a little bit different ways. So um, be sure to look at them and find which one suits, um, is best suited for you and contact Tina for those um, hard copies. Um, we talked about point source and non-point source pollution. Um, again, that's um, that's um, an important piece of, of what, what we're teaching about. 
And then again, there's there's those chemical parameters. We talked about the um, temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, uh, nitrates, phosphates, turbidity, conductivity. I miss anything? I think that's pretty good. All right, any questions? I don't want to keep going because I know Andrea needs to get going pretty soon. So yes, if I could just add really quick. <clears throat> sure. Um, if if the students realize listening to you today and listening to our first one water you know we still have the same amount of water on earth today as the first day of earth so that's not changing but what's changing is those biological chemical and physical properties and there's always a cause and an effect and if we stop to think about it we can understand it and then once you understand the cause and effect you will have a really good handle on aquatic information so right as you're reviewing these different <clears throat> sources that you choose, um, look for that cause and effect. You know, if this, if temperature's high, then what's the DO? If temperatures are high and we have nitrate runoff, you know, so it's a cause and effect. And once you do that, you got it, you got it down. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Benita, for that. Um, okay, here are the, some questions I have. If on a farmer's property, there is an annual blue algae problem and it is harming the wildlife reserve that is across the water body, what measure can be taken to reduce runoff, law, rule-wise, and how can that reserve be protected? Well, <clears throat> one part of that is, um, well, one, as long as, I guess, whatever chemicals are being applied, you know, falls within a, a legal range, but there's, I don't think there's anything legally you can do, but there are what we call best management practices for land use. And those practices, I'm sure you'll hear about them through soils and forestry too. Um, there are things like um, plant vegetation buffer strips. So um, uh, <clears throat> again, plants love fertilizer, whether it's trees, grass, aquatic plants, crops, whatever. And so by growing, um, by ensuring that there is a, a, an adequate um, vegeta vegetation buffer next to that, um, then those, uh, uh, those plants can use up a lot of those excess nutrients before they get a chance to get into the water body. Um, so I think that's, that's I, I guess, uh, I guess as far as my knowledge, that's, that's the best guess. I, that's the best, um, uh, yeah, management press practice that I can think of. And like, I know in Minnesota now they're starting to, um, there are laws um, that egg producers especially are gonna have to start leaving larger buffer strips um, next to um, aquatic, um, next to rivers, streams, lakes or whatever. And I don't think that's come to North Dakota yet. We're not quite the environment, don't have quite the passion for environmental topics like they do in, in other states. And I guess that's, Part of what we're trying to instill in in you guys through Envirothon is that some of these, it doesn't take a lot, but so just some of these practices can go a long way in protecting our um, the environment and our water sources. So again, a, a natural way to do it is just plant some plant some plant some trees, plant grass, and um, let those uh, let them do I guess what they do best. We have in North Dakota, we have some of the best native uh, aquatic plants. And unfortunately, as recreators, we don't want to have to deal with those cattails and bulrush and all those aquatic plants, but they are beautiful um, filters for taking out nitrates and phosphates uh, in the runoff process, especially all of the mat that occurs at the bottom of a wetland. Uh, but like I said, many um, of the wetlands or the prairie potholes that we used to have in the state of North Dakota has decreased more than 60%. So we have less area to help hold some of this water runoff. And then let's put tile draining in there as well. Tile draining is a way for us to determine which way our water runs off. Well, it's easier for me to run it off on a lake that's already established than allowing a wetland or a prairie pothole to grow in the middle of my field if I'm looking to maximize my profit. I mean, that's the bottom line. 
more plants, more profit, hopefully. So, um, but the, the best management practice is correct, Benita, that uh, having those buffer systems, having other bodies to do water storage, such as prairie potholes and wetlands, or even temporary sloughs help in that process a lot. I hope that answered your question there, Brooke. 